it is an incredible honor to be here today to celebrate your graduation. And it's a pleasure for me because there are a number of students out there, quite a number, it turned out too many for me to get away listing, who I remember from class, a class they took from me. Um, not soon after, not long after, Chancellor Holden Thorpe called me with this invitation. I remembered an advertisement I'd seen on TV that made me wonder about the wisdom of having an ethics professor here to speak to you at commencement. Here's how I remember that advertisement. You'll see it on the screen. It's for a company called Viridian Dynamics. Viridian Dynamics, doing the right thing, it's important. What does it mean in business? We have no idea. We know what wrong is. Actually, no, we don't. Because we're a successful company, not some boring ethics professor. Viridian Dynamics, right and wrong. It means something. We just don't know what. So you understand my hesitation coming before you. Nonetheless, in my capacity as an ethics professor, I'd like to flag three questions that are hovering in the air and that I expect are at the forefront of many of your minds. The first, what am I going to do? Who am I going to be? And what am I going to contribute? These three questions are questions that every single person, consciously or not, answers in the course of their life. They loom large now at graduation, but you need to keep in mind that people don't answer this in a day. They don't answer it in a decade. You answer the questions over the course of your life by the decisions you make. I'm worried, though, that in focusing on these three questions that are on your minds, I give the false impression that this commencement ceremony is all about you, about your accomplishments, about your future. It's not. It's been my observation that very few people remember their own commencement. The commencement they remember is the commencements of their friends, and most especially the commencements of their children. By the way, it's my observation that no one remembers the commencement address, just to put that in perspective. But it's no surprise, because for you guys, this commencement is just a natural next step on a project that you've been involved in, most of you, for years. It may represent, it almost surely does, a lot of hard work. And it's a serious triumph. And for some of you, it's kind of a surprise to yourselves that you made it. But for you, you're aware of every step you've been taking. You know that what you've learned, what you've done, what you've studied adds up to making it here to commencement. Things are very different for your parents and for your grandparents and for some of your friends. They have very vivid memories of you when you were about the size of a bread box. Some of them remember tucking you under their arms and dodging imaginary tacklers as they ran around the house. Others remember carrying you on snugglies and feeling the pleasure of you falling asleep close to their hearts. They remember as well watching you play and your face light up with excitement and enthusiasm when you discovered something new. They, discover, they remember a lot of other things, not all of them pleasant, and I'm not going to harp on them now, but they have vivid memories of when you were little. And they saw you grow up until you left college. They saw that growing up as a continuous path. No matter how much you matured, 
how adult you became, what you had accomplished when you went off to college, and it's been a long time for some of you, when you went off for college, they had a sense of a continuity in your life. They saw in you the baby they had held, the child they had played with, the person they had discovered, when she falls, I hurt. When she's happy, I'm ecstatic. They saw that continuity in you. But now, for them to see you here is a revelation to them. There isn't a continuity. When they sent you off to college, you were someone they knew each step of the way. Now, what you've done, what you know, how you've spent your time and what you've accomplished is a thing of wonder for them, I hope, and trust and also a point of vicarious pride. And it's important for you to keep that in mind during this commencement. In addition, it's worth keeping in mind all the people who were your teachers, who worked hard in graduate school for those with a doctorate degree or getting a master's degree, in college, in high school, in junior high or middle school, in preschool, there are legions of people who dedicated themselves to helping to bring you here. There are as well, in addition to parents and grandparents and teachers, a huge number of people who in quiet dignity answered their three questions by working hard to make you safe and healthy and to make it possible for you to be here today. For all of these people, the value of their answer to the three questions, their answer to what will they do, who will they be, what will they contribute, the value of the answers they've given to that is sitting right here. In recognition of that, I'd like to ask you to stand up, stretch your legs. If there's somebody here who played that role, face them and thank them with your applause. If there are people not here, Think of them in your heart and your mind, and please thank all those who have made an effort to make it possible for you to be here at commencement. Keep in mind, this event is in large part in honor of them as well as you. Please, stand up. Okay, thank you. Now back to those three questions in your mind. It's a sad fact that some people give the same two answers to each of the three questions. Nothing much. What am I going to do? Nothing much. Who am I going to be? Nothing much. What am I going to contribute? Nothing much. Let me be clear as your commencement speaker. If you remember nothing else, remember I don't recommend that answer. <laughs> but if not that answer, what answer? Well, as a scholar, I thought I better do some careful research. So I hopped on Google and I found a lot of uh, commencement addresses. And I discovered that it's a tradition among commencement speakers to cull from their experience insights and advice that turned out, as I reviewed it, to be of the sort that might help you answer the three questions. Here's one. Never lose your youthful enthusiasm. That light in your eyes that your parents saw, make sure you keep it. Find someone and something other than yourself to love. Reach for the stars, but don't miss the beauty around you every day. Develop your talents. Use your talents. Enjoy your talents. 
Don't run with scissors. <laughs> Remember that Russian roulette is always a bad idea. And so, I think, is chat roulette. <laughs> Some people here know what that is. I'm a little worried. Other people here don't know what it is. Ask those who do. Now, I have 47 more. So that's why it was important to get you up and get stretched. But instead of going through those 47, I wanted to take an opportunity to give you a way of thinking about the education you've received, an image. You all know, all of you, that running through your body at this moment is a little bit of Bach, a little bit of Beethoven, some Howard Stern, a little NPR, some Rush Limbaugh, a sermon or two, some Kanye West, some Dwight Yoakam. The sound waves that are all around you are invisible, intangible, odorless, and, unless you have a radio, inaudible. Fortunately, I have a radio. Just to make the point vivid, in you now. some of us parents. In the same way, though they're invisible, intangible, odorless, and by and large inaudible, you are surrounded by ideas. Ideas of who you are, what you can accomplish, what problems you'll face, what solutions you might be able to solve, what's worth doing in life and what's a waste of time, what can give you meaning, and what will leach meaning out of your life. Those ideas are all around us. And even the ideas you don't hear, you don't have hold of, other people do. And because they do, because they're influenced by them, shaped by them, respond to you in light of them, your possibilities, your options, your accomplishments are shaped by them. Fortunately, you carry around the equivalent of a radio tuner, your minds. If your education here has worked well, what it's done more than anything else is taught you how to use your mind to pick out ideas, to fine-tune them, to adjust them, to reject them, or to embrace them as you deem them worthwhile. The point of higher education, the value of the education you've gotten here at Carolina, is not solely, maybe even not primarily, knowledge transfer. It's capacity expansion. And the key capacity that's expanded in higher education is the capacity to by yourself focus on the ideas that are all around you. Bring them to the fore, turn them around, look at them from every side, and put yourself in the position to decide which of them are worth embracing and which are worth changing. Our future, your future, all of our future, depends on coming up with new ideas, on addressing old problems in ways that nobody realized were even conceivable, let alone doable. But it's worth keeping in mind, at the same time, that not all new ideas are any good at all. And some of the very best ideas are very old indeed. So what I'd like to do at the very end here is remind you of a small set of really wonderful ideas from Plato's Republic. 
These are ideas that give you a model for how to think about how you can and should address the three questions that I started with. As Socrates, the main character in the Republic, for those of you who didn't do the reading, <laughs> argues, it's valuable to recognize of people that they can be more or less sorted according to how they make decisions, according, as he puts it, to their constitution. What for them is their bottom line when they face new options? As he saw it, there were five types of people. The worst type to be stuck being is to be someone who is, as he put it, tyrannically sold, who somehow has made it be the case, or let it happen to herself, that she's governed by a desire, the acting on which is bad for her and all those around her. Pedophiles, alcoholics, drug addicts, sometimes become tyrannically sold, so that every decision is settled for them by the strength of one of these tyrannical desires. Another kind of person to be, he thought, is someone who is democratically sold. Someone who settles what she'll do, who she'll be, what she'll contribute, according to how she happens to feel at the time, what most satisfies the majority of her desires in proportion to their strength. But he thought some people are more disciplined than the democratically sold. He thought there were people he characterized as oligarchically sold. These are people for whom the bottom line was the bottom line. The question, what to do, here, now, with my life, with my decisions about to, what to contribute, was settled by who would pay them the most for it. Finally, he thought, there are some people, and these are the people he thought we should all aspire to be, who address the choices in life by asking and answering the question, What's worth doing? What's of value? And then managing to let that question and their answer settle their choice for them. To be like that is, he thought, to be aristocratically sold. And in the Republic, and there's a long argument, and I won't go through it, Socrates argues that only the aristocratically sold person, only the person disposed to ask of her options, her options concerning what to do, who to be, what to contribute. Only the person who asks of those options, what's worth doing? Not, what will people pay me for? Not, what will make me popular? Not, what will satisfy my desires? Only the person who asks what's worth doing is autonomous. Every other person has handed her decisions over to those with the power those who control the opinion, those who can manipulate your desires. True freedom, true autonomy, rests in you being sure through the course of your life that in addressing the three questions, you turn your attention to the question, what's important here? What's worth fighting for? What's worth my time? And not what will make me popular, what will get me money, or what do I happen to feel like doing? Not because those other things aren't important, but they're important only sometimes, in some contexts, and in light of some people's willingness to pay and not others. So I want to close by just going back to these pressing questions. What are you going to do? Who are you going to be? And what are you going to contribute? And I want you to keep in mind the model of all the people around you who in making those choices through their lives worked hard to make sure that you have what you have now, an expanded capacity to live a free and fulfilling life thanks to your ability to think well and clearly about things in ways you couldn't possibly have done before. So I thank everybody here for your time and attention and I congratulate you all on your commencement and I congratulate and thank you all for all that you've done to help them be here today. Thank you very much.